In a museum vault, there lies an iron axe head forged in the year 1200, 800 years old. Pick it up, examine the blade. The surface, dark, weathered with patina, yet beneath it, the metal is solid, strong, no deep pitting, no decay, no weakness. Now, step outside. Walk to your garden shed. There sits a steel axe you bought just two years ago. Already the head is spotted with orange rust. In five years, it'll be so corroded, you'll throw it away. How is this possible? How can something made with primitive tools in a clay furnace outlast precision-engineered modern steel by centuries? The answer is not magic. It's chemistry. An accident and a lost understanding of iron that we sacrificed for convenience. Before we dive into this forgotten science, if you believe we've lost something valuable in our race for cheap, disposable tools, drop that comment now. To understand why medieval iron resisted rust, we must first understand what modern steel really is. When you buy a tool today, you're getting what metallurgists call mild steel. It contains roughly 0.25% carbon, zero slag, and zero phosphorus. We call this progress. But medieval wrought iron was fundamentally different. It contained only 0.05% carbon, yet up to 2% slag, those glassy impurities left over from smelting. It also held phosphorus, sometimes as much as 0.25%, an element that came naturally from the ore. Modern steel production deliberately removes both slag and phosphorus. Why? Because they make the steel harder to process in factories. Slag-free steel can be rolled into sheets faster. Phosphorus-free steel welds more easily on assembly lines. We optimized for speed, not durability. But here's what we didn't understand. Until recently, those impurities were not flaws. They were features. When modern steel rusts, corrosion digs straight down. A droplet of moisture touches the surface. Oxygen reacts with iron. Rust forms. That rust is porous. It traps more moisture, which creates more rust. The corrosion burrows deeper, following the grain of the metal, like roots creeping through cracks in concrete. A microscopic flaw in modern steel becomes a highway for rust. Nothing stops it. Within months, surface rust becomes structural damage. But medieval wrought iron had a secret weapon, slag stringers. During forging, as the blacksmith hammered the bloom, tiny threads of glassy slag stretched through the metal. Under a microscope, it looks like wood grain, thousands of glass fibers running through the iron matrix. When rust tried to start on wrought iron, it hit one of these slag barriers. The glass fiber blunted the corrosion, forcing it to spread sideways instead of sinking deep. The result? An axe head that forms a protective patina and stops corroding instead of crumbling into orange dust. If you're learning something valuable here, hit that like button. It costs nothing, but it helps this knowledge reach the people who need to hear it. Tools that expensive were listed in wills, fought over in inheritance disputes, marked with the owner's symbol like a family crest carved into iron. Medieval blacksmiths trained for seven years as apprentices before they could even call themselves journeymen. Another seven years might pass before a smith earned the title of master and the right to open his own forge. This was not romantic tradition. It was economic necessity. A poorly made tool that failed could kill someone. A plow that broke during planting season could mean hunger, could mean starvation. The medieval guild system enforced quality with brutal simplicity. If your work failed, you were expelled from the guild. No guild membership meant no legal right to sell your work. The guild's reputation was worth more than any individual smith, so quality wasn't optional. We look at medieval iron's rust resistance and think it was all about superior technique, but technique alone means nothing without economic pressure to maintain standards. They made iron that lasted because making iron that failed was financial suicide. Today, a hardware store axe costs $15, if it rusts out in two years, you buy another one. The manufacturer isn't punished. There is no guild to expel them. The economic incentive has inverted completely. Planned obsolescence isn't a conspiracy. It's simply more profitable than permanence.
medieval smiths understood something we've almost completely forgotten. Fresh iron needs treatment. After forging a tool to its final shape, the smith would perform a process we might now call seasoning, though they never used that word. The finished piece was heated until it glowed a dull red, then rubbed with linseed oil or animal fat while still hot. The heat caused the oil to polymerize, forming a hard, thin coating bonded directly to the metal surface. This coating was not paint. It was a molecular shield that sealed the iron from moisture and oxygen. You season a cast iron pan the same way today. But modern steel tools? They come with nothing. Maybe a thin coat of machine oil that washes off the first time it rains. No one teaches you to season your tools because modern steel is disposable by design. Medieval iron that was used regularly gained another advantage. A dark, stable patina formed on the surface. This was not rust in the destructive sense. It was magnetite, a form of iron oxide that is dense and protective. Frequent use kept this patina intact. The oil from human hands, the friction of work, the regular exposure to air without long stretches of moisture. All of this maintained a protective surface layer. Tools that were stored dry and used often could last for generations. The grandson would inherit his grandfather's hammer, and the iron would still be sound. We abandon these practices not because they didn't work, but because they required care. Modern tools are designed to be replaced, not maintained. You might ask, if medieval iron was so superior in rust resistance, why don't we make it that way now? The answer is economics, not ignorance. A bloomery furnace produces maybe 50 pounds of iron per day. A modern blast furnace produces thousands of tons. The difference is not just scale, it's control. In a blast furnace, temperatures exceed 1,500 degrees Celsius. Iron melts completely. Slag is skimmed off as liquid waste. The result is molten pig iron with high carbon content that must be refined into steel in a separate process. Fast, efficient, consistent. But that consistency comes at a cost. You cannot control the microscopic distribution of slag stringers in liquid metal. You cannot accidentally preserve beneficial phosphorus while removing harmful sulfur. The bloomery process was slow precisely because it operated at the edge of iron's transformation, in that narrow temperature range where solid-state chemistry could work its magic. We traded that magic for the ability to make a billion fence posts per year. Most of them will rust away in a decade. But they are cheap. The bloomery gave medieval smiths a chaotic mix of materials in every bloom, soft wrought iron, harder steel, and protective slag. A lesser craftsman might see this as a problem. A master saw it as an opportunity. The smith could read the metal. By striking a piece against a grinding wheel and watching the sparks, he could identify carbon content. Soft iron throws long, lazy orange sparks. High carbon steel erupts in brilliant white bursts. Using this sensory knowledge, the smith sorted the bloom. High carbon pieces were precious. They became the cutting edge. The softer wrought iron, tough and shock absorbent, formed the body and spine of the blade. These pieces were forge welded together, heated to white hot temperatures. Their surfaces began to liquefy just slightly. A few hammer blows and they fused permanently into one. The result was a blade with a hard edge that held its sharpness, supported by a flexible core that absorbed impact without shattering. This composite structure, hard edge, tough body, was not one material trying to be two things. It was two materials, each doing what it did best. Some smiths took this further, creating pattern welded blades. Bars of iron and steel were twisted together before forging, the finished blade showed a water-like pattern on the surface, beautiful and functional. But here's what mattered for rust resistance. Those forge welds created more interfaces, more boundaries where slag stringers could form protective networks. A pattern welded blade was not just strong, it was armored against corrosion from the inside out. Medieval alchemy. That actually worked. If you read old blacksmithing texts, you'll find recipes that sound like witchcraft. 
Theophilus, a 12th century German monk, wrote in 1125 that tools are given a harder tempering in the urine of a small red-haired boy than in ordinary water. Other medieval manuscripts describe even stranger concoctions. One recipe called for one part white radish, one part horseradish, one part earthworm, lavy, and one part buck's blood when the buck is in rut. Another recommended clarified honey, fresh urine of a he-goat, alum, borax, olive oil, and salt, mixed together as the perfect quenching liquid. For centuries, historians dismissed these as superstition. Folklore, the mystical thinking of people who didn't understand chemistry. Then modern metallurgists decided to test them. The results were surprising. Most of the exotic quenchants didn't work. Blood, despite its legendary status in sword-making lore, cooled steel far too slowly to harden it properly. Milk was equally useless. The romantic image of a blade quenched in the blood of enemies? Pure fantasy. But two liquids worked remarkably well, water and urine. Why urine? The answer is simple chemistry hiding behind mystical language. Urine contains urea, which breaks down into ammonia and carbon dioxide. More importantly, it contains salts, sodium chloride, potassium, and other minerals. When you plunge red-hot steel into pure water, something problematic happens. A layer of steam forms instantly around the metal. This steam envelope acts as insulation, slowing the cooling rate. If the steel cools too slowly, it doesn't harden. Salt solves this problem. The particulates in salted water, or in urine, disrupt that steam layer before it can fully form. The liquid keeps direct contact with the hot metal. Cooling happens faster. Hardening succeeds. Medieval smiths discovered this through trial and error. They didn't know about steam envelopes or nucleate boiling. They just knew that quenching in urine or brine produced harder tools than pure water, so they wrapped that practical knowledge in mystical language. The urine of a red-headed boy was probably just memorable phrasing for add salt to your quench. Those elaborate recipes with honey, herbs, and animal parts? They added organic compounds and minerals that further disrupted steam formation. The smiths were conducting material science experiments, one quench at a time, recording what worked without understanding why. After hardening steel in a quench, medieval smiths performed another critical step, tempering. They would gently reheat the blade and watch colors spread across the polished surface, pale straw yellow, deep bronze, peacock blue, purple. These colors weren't decoration. They were an exquisitely precise temperature gauge caused by the thickness of oxide layers forming on the steel. Each color corresponded to a specific temperature, and each temperature produced different material properties. Straw yellow around 230 degrees Celsius made steel perfect for cutting edges. Bronze around 255 degrees Celsius was ideal for springs and swords that needed flexibility. Blue, around 300 degrees Celsius, created tools that could absorb impacts without shattering. The smith would heat the blade until the desired color appeared, then immediately quench it again to lock in that exact microstructure. He was manipulating crystalline transformations in steel, using nothing but his eyes and experience. We still use color tempering today, but medieval smiths developed this technique not through theory, but through patient observation. They noticed that a blade heated to bronze color survived battle better than one tempered to blue. So they codified that knowledge in guild secrets and master-apprentice relationships. The mystical language protected valuable trade secrets. But behind every invocation of the four elements or the proper phase of the moon, there was real, tested, repeatable science. We just needed three more centuries of chemistry to understand what they already knew how to do. Medieval iron was not perfect, it was not pure, it was not consistent. By every modern metallurgical standard, it was inferior. And yet, a knife forged in the year 1300 can still cut. An axe from 1150 can still split wood, not despite their imperfections, but because of them. The slag that modern refineries throw away as waste was microscopic armor.
The phosphorus that modern processes remove as contamination was a rust inhibitor. The slow, labor-intensive bloomery process created an internal structure that liquid metal blast furnaces simply cannot replicate. We didn't lose this knowledge in some dark age catastrophe. We abandoned it deliberately. We chose quantity over longevity, convenience over quality, cheap over lasting. The genius of the medieval blacksmith was not in eliminating imperfection. It was in understanding that imperfection, when properly controlled, could become strength. Those primitive smiths standing before their clay furnaces knew something profound. They knew how to read the soul of iron. They knew which rocks to gather from the marsh. They knew that patient, repeated heating and hammering created something no factory can mass produce. They built tools meant to outlive the builder. We build tools meant to be replaced. That is not progress. That is a choice. And every rusted fence post, every corroded garden tool, every hardware store axe that lasts two seasons is a reminder of what we chose. If this opened your eyes to how much we've sacrificed in the name of cheap manufacturing, make sure you're subscribed. We're digging up more forgotten technology that puts modern solutions to shame. Hit that like button if you want to see us tackle more topics like this. What other ancient technology deserves a closer look? Drop your suggestions in the comments. And remember, every time you buy a tool, you're voting with your money. Buy once, cry once, or buy cheap, buy twice, and fill landfills with rust. Thanks for watching.